Yes. Hello, and welcome to the fifth episode of the Secure Cloudcast. I'm by myself this month, so kicking off the Happy New Year, but with some good friends in the background. The ACM team is on today to talk about, uh, let's say, policy, compliance, governance, and a lot more, maybe a little demo as well. For those who don't know, I'm Mike Foster. I'm a PMM here at Red Hat. Uh, specifically, I deal with security, ACS mostly. Um, and speaking of, got a couple announcements. OpenShift 4.12, 4.12 is out. So check out those release notes. And as well, the ACS blog, all the updates on the security front for ACS will be coming out tomorrow. Definitely want to check that out. It wraps up everything that we're doing and um, as well gives a roadmap for the future. Lastly, Cloud Native Security Con is next week. So the CNCF is putting on their big, I guess, flagship security event, whatever you want to call it. It was typically tied to KubeCon and now they're doing their own thing. Don't know why, but we get to go to C Seattle in February. So pack, uh, pack some warm clothes and get ready for some good food. But other than that, because I don't want to you know, hog the show to myself, I need to get my guests in here. I'm bringing on Mina and Scott from the ACM team to talk everything ACM, obviously, compliance, governance. Like I said, welcome, welcome, y'all. And hey. on, let's, let's share Hello. the screen a little bit. Awesome, man. Thank What's you up, guys Mike? for joining. <laughs> What's up, Scott? Yeah. Do you guys uh, want to introduce yourself for the uh, the crowd watching at home? Sure, sure. I'll, should I go first, Scott? Lady, ladies first, Mina. Go for it. All right. Thank you. Hey, everyone. I'm Mina. I'm a PMM at Red Hat. Uh, I specifically deal with advanced cluster management and uh, work pretty closely with Scott here, but uh, excited to be here and talk to you guys a little bit more about ACM, how it relates to security, governance, policy, all of that. Awesome. Mina's a rock star. I get the pleasure of working with her. Mike, I, don't ask me any questions about baseball today. I'm going to fail uh, other than I know you're a superstar. So, hey, my name is Scott Behrens. I am a product manager here at Red Hat. I get to work in an awesome area, uh, a, a challenge that's been in front of us for about the past five years now, and that is in the cluster management space. Our product is advanced cluster management. A lot of people call it ACM or Rackham. Red Hat Advanced Cluster Management for Kubernetes. Doesn't really roll off the tongue, but um, we didn't win the lottery on the naming <laughs> to get there. Uh, but it is descriptive and it sort of explains to the world what we're what we're about. Yes, Red Hat and our acronyms, or also partially IBM and their acronyms, because ACM started as an IBM project, correct? That's right, yeah. I actually worked at IBM, started in 2004 on a bunch of different stuff, all of it kind of like data center and virtualization and management related. And ACM, we hatched uh, as a project called MCM, Multi-Cloud Manager. And at that time, we were just kind of feeling the pain of Kubernetes clusters in our own engineering org and our own sprawl. Uh, we were working on a project called IBM Cloud Private at that time. And yeah, we, we really just found like, hey, we need some way to, to get an inventory of this stuff. We need a way to, to distribute applications to it. We need a way to convert configure it and make sure it's compliant with what we think it should be. And, and if it's not, make sure that we can bring it under compliance. And yeah, so it really just grew out of that. And around, I think it was like 2018 was our first official launch in the fall of 2018. And then, man, yeah, it's been a fun ride. We came over to Red Hat starting in March, right mm -hmm. when the pandemic was coming down. It was like the whole, the whole entire world was icing over. Uh, and we were kind of just like sliding into Red Hat at that moment of time. We were one of the last teams that did a new hire orientation uh, there at the Red Hat Tower before everything just kind of shut down. Mm -hmm. um, so it was 2020. And yeah, fast forward here, like two years, two quick years, and we're up to version 2.7 coming out. Check my date, Mina. You might know, is it February 8th? Is that when we're right. announcing? Yeah, so it's right around the corner with 2.7. It's been a fun ride here at Red Hat. Great culture, great people, great opportunity to work with OpenShift very closely. Mm -hmm. yeah, and from the ACS standpoint, we went through something similar. I think I've been at Red Hat for two years now. You guys set the standard for acronym and we had to follow. So we became <laughs> ACS or uh, yeah, Red Hat Advanced Cluster Security for Kubernetes. Um, and I think it makes sense that we both kind of got merged together, right? You're solving a very similar issue, but more at the cluster level. Um, I think even coming over really from a, let's say, Kubernetes cluster level, I only thought of Rancher in the space and then the other mm -hmm. cloud providers. So hearing about ACM and, you know, what you're looking to solve for was very interesting. You mind just covering sort of that basic use case of 
what, when, why you got merged over to Red Hat, because you know why it pairs so well with OpenShift, and then what it's going to accomplish as part of the greater for portfolio. sure. Yeah, and, and Mina, you're gonna you're gonna jump in on this one as you feel comfortable. Like our history in that in that space, Michael. Once IBM acquired Red Hat, we decided that there was one platform to win them all, and that was OpenShift. And we went all in on OpenShift, and we oh. we still are from an IBM perspective. Uh, they're cranking out cloud packs, as you know, and and those are all based on OpenShift as the best platform on the planet. And so our mission really became, how do you make it ridiculously easy to cover this planet red with OpenShift? Um, deploying those clusters, you know, a bunch of little small ones out, you know, edge clusters, central data center, which needs maybe some beefier nodes and stuff like that. So really any kind of range, any kind of environment, whether it's financial or telco or media, entertainment, healthcare, whatever, you name it, industrial, retail, whatever vertical you're hanging out in, there is a cluster that's right for you. And ACM is the product that makes it easy to spray that cluster out, configure it, apply applications on there, even doing things like cross cluster communication, like multi-cluster pod networking with Submariner, allowing pods to communicate with each other. I'd say at that time, you know, Rancher was one of the, the hottest, it, it, it's still a super hot product uh, and, and project for, for all intents and purposes. It focuses a lot on their upstream community and how they're wrapping their arms around engagement with this multi-cluster challenge is super cool. Uh, so a lot of kudos and respect for what's going on. And then you started to see, you know, IBM was building our own and, and then you started to see Google Anthos. And then of course, AWS was, was uh, starting to pilot outposts at that mm -hmm. point, which is bringing their kind of cloud model down on premise for you and kind of bridging the gap. Azure comes out with Arc. So there's been a steady trend as each of these hyperscalers has started to like put out their uh, ideas and, and put out their projects in this space. Uh, it, it feels cool that we were kind of early in on that problem. Um, I'm not trying to like toot our horn and say we were the first. I don't think that's true, but we, we started to focus more on the enterprise and how we can deliver value to, to, to you know, larger corporations that need to know things about security and they need to care about things like FIPS compliance and what's going on with you know, SOC compliance and, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, we really started to hone in our message and, and narrow in more on the security ops point of view. How do we start to dial in a consistent way of doing this, which is, is built around a Kubernetes methodology and everything we were doing from the ground up was based on a, a Kube architecture with desired state. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's really kind of how we got into this spot. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's great to see competition out there. It's great to see VMware and Tanzu, like they started getting into the fold the last few years and everybody kind of has their horse. You know, I'm, I don't want to pick winners. I just want to pick good technology and make sure people can use it. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned a bunch of competitors and a lot of technology there. Mina, what do you think are some of the bigger challenges regarding, you know, sort of consolidating that into a specific message? Like, you know, how do you make it consumable, right? Because there is so much, uh, let's say tech knowledge that you have to know to be able to convey this. And you're also relying on other people to understand containers and how to scale them. So a lot Definitely. of challenges there, wondering how you consolidate all that. Definitely. And, you know, cluster management never comes off as like this sexy hot topic that everybody's <laughs> like into. Am I not supposed to say sexy? Whatever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, it is at the core of hybrid cloud strategy and it is something that's extremely important if you want to scale and if you want to, you know, uh, be consistent and reduce operational costs. Everybody loves reducing costs. So it's definitely always there, even for edge deployments, if you want to, you know, think about the future. Um, but customers always do need to think about this, think about cu um, cluster management, but they usually don't unless they're the ones that are like manually managing thousands of clusters at once. So that's kind of like what we're trying to do here, marketing with this live stream, even like talking about stuff like this. Um, is to ensure like people understand if you invest in a tool like advanced cluster management, if you focus on cluster management, you can scale and you mm -hmm. can also support um, CICD all throughout. Um, but I think that is a challenge, like making people understand like this is never probably this is probably never going to be a hot topic. It's probably never going to be like at the top of like, you know, the sexiest technology out there, but it is necessary and it is important. Um, do, you, do you see yourself getting more traction as there's more container Kubernetes IoT device adoption? So as that industry scales, they're going to hit 
I'm assuming a wall where management becomes extremely hard, but it's harder to convey that when they're early in the process, right? Exactly. I think the more like you, you know, use edge deployments, the more you use IoT, the more you have like these remote locations that you need to manage, the more that that management aspect is going to come in. Mm-hmm. And I've seen it too, Michael, just to add into what Mina is saying there, as you grow your business to a cloud or as you acquire a new team, you're bringing in a different skill set, potentially even a different billing model for how you're going to use that infrastructure. And that's part of the friction we're trying to solve. Those are cultural differences as teams come on board. Those are regional differences as they're using some you know some different cloud interface over there or maybe they're using on-premise but right just kind of like smoothing over all the friction around those lines all those hazards uh, exactly as mina said just making sure it works everywhere for you part of that open hybrid cloud mission very very nice uh, and i'm assuming that one of the uh, the earlier you invest in a technology like this the greater the payoff assuming you're scaling and adopting right because i mean that is the whole sales pitch for policy, right? And, uh, and get ops in general, um, repeatability. But how do you, yeah, yeah. repeatability, but how do you, um, sort of communicate that to the customer or to somebody who's using the technology? I mean, what, what is it we say, uh, you know, it, it works for one cluster. Once you get your guardrails in there, you know, that you, how does Jeff put this? You know, that you're able to take on water before the boat is sinking. Jeff and his sayings. He also says you always <laughs> sell the shirt with the pants, the pants with the belt. <laughs> he, yeah. He's Shout got out to weird the dude. stuff like that. <laughs> Shout out to the dude, Jeff Brent. But the point is that you put your guardrails in place so that before you're hemorrhaging and having a, a major headache experience, you know, the ship is sinking and you start bailing water with a bucket. You want to know that you've got all the guardrails in place for that first cluster so that by the time you get to your 10th and 100th and 1,000th, it's routine. Policy is already defined in code. You know how to you know how to spin up a cluster, define day two around it, and and you know push that out to your dev your dev experience right there. So I mean that kind of brings you to this topic of like where do we where do we see like ACM in terms of our strengths and you know we can create clusters, we can deploy applications to them, we can wire them together with networking. Where we really start to stand out is in the security operations and all of these pillars, every part of this product has security capabilities within it. But it's when we talk about policy, the way we approach governance, risk and compliance as a policy engine, as a way to define desired state, to work your clusters up to that desired state across the fleet, we want that to be repeatable. And policy is just a chunk of YAML code. It's just a chunk that says, hey, do this, either audit this for me, like just inform about it or enforce it, go make that change. Uh, we can do a demo later on, but I, you know something simple like creating a namespace or it, you know encrypting a CD. I'll show that later on. But those are the kind of basic things we want people to wrap their head around: is using code in a repetitive way, having that code stored in a repository where people can interface with it, and then being able to share that story outbound to your security ops team so mm-hmm. they can have audit control and compliance point of view. Yeah, asynchronously, especially with the security team, that's awesome. And I know from an ACS standpoint, you know, having a cluster that your secured cluster automatically gets deployed to and talks to uh, ACS Central, you have the security team doesn't even need to know when you're starting up a cluster or, or creating a new node or doing any sort of updates, you automatically see that. So there's a, especially, I mean, CSPMs and the whole sales pitch for that is security through observa- ob- observability, excuse me. Um, being able to see all of your assets in a cloud or on-prem is, is huge. And you can do all that in ACM as well, right? You can see all your clusters, you can see the nodes, all the resources that are running. Yeah, so it's pretty a uh, pretty intense project. I'm wondering, like, what are the what are the downsides of ACM? What are some of the issues um, or limitations, let's say, that you can have, whether it be a cloud or just with cluster management in general? Great question. Uh, I'll start, and then Mina, you jump in. I think like the name we already got past the name as a downside. <laughs> just bad joke. Uh, no, I think the uh, I think like as you grow, right, the challenges get bigger, and so. Yeah, scale is is a is a challenge, right? Like the devices get smaller, but the number of nodes maybe gets higher because you're you're wanting to cover ten thousand and a hundred thousand things. So I think for us, like that's really been our goal as we've worked more closely with our partners in the telco and, and telecommunications space. We've really started to to move in and say, hey, we can really help you uh, understand how the the access works on your entire eastern seaboard on the entire west coast as you're deploying 5g so those are some of the 
like I wouldn't call them downsides, but kind of challenges that we've faced as we've grown mm -hmm. in our ability to, to contain more of those use cases and scenarios. You just start to see like operationally, as you take on one hospital and then they're like, this is great. Now we want all of our hospitals within our network to start using this. You start to see, okay, we have this hub and spoke model. Now we need like an Uber hub. And maybe that's just something where you view all of this stuff from there, but you aren't necessarily pushing buttons to make changes. So I think the challenges in my mind is really just as you grow, as you bring in more capabilities, making sure the stability is there, making sure the security is baked in from end to end. And that really is like something, Mike, like working with OpenShift and, and working tightly with the the, the BU and, and all of the engineering staff in there has just been a phenomenal experience. I know you've seen it too, but just in terms of the the rigor. Uh, the expertise, the knowledge, all the subject matter experts uh, in, in that field of Kubernetes, the upstream maintainers, all of the advocates that know the best practices around how to deploy those nodes, all that stuff, like we benefit immensely from that security model, the security minded mindset <laughs> from A to Z about everything that Red Hat does. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just awesome the way we can bake new features, but make sure you bake it with security throughout that entire process, building it the right way from the ground up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially the larger, I mean, this is why cloud platforms get paid so much, is the the less I have to worry about, the more that security is baked in the beginning, the less downstream effects you're going to have. If I know that encryption is in every cluster and certain security controls are in the cluster, when I turn on ACS, well, then I can just focus on my applications. I don't need to actually go and go upstream and yell at some ops people for their deployment, right? It, it actually sounds like you have a very similar issue that we have with container security, where everybody's used to using virtual machines. And there would be you know, not as many virtual machines as containers. And then we move to containers, people realize, well, you can't keep track of them all. They're just getting too small and they're too fast. And they, you know, they run for 30 seconds, and then they're gone. So then the, the conversation becomes, okay, now we just need to start moving things you know, upstream and set our controls where it's automated so we can actually you know, get, a, get a grip on all of our resources that are out there, right? And I think that as you know, we get into hypershift, single node open shift that ACM is managing, you start to run into that same issue, right? Where things are getting a lot smaller. How do your teams actually understand all the resources that are out there? Uh, and how do you actually create a dashboard that can, that can show all this information? I think, cause I know the ACS dashboard is a wealth of information, but also a little overwhelming for some first time users. Do you get sort of the same opinion when you demo AC, uh, ACM? Yeah. Yeah, well, like a dashboard is an instantaneous RFE magnet. Like you, you put up your opinion of what should be in a dashboard, and then there's 15 new opinions that say, no, it should have this, it should have that. Uh, I, yeah, and like what's the right amount of information to show? Do you have a zoom in slider so you can go from the global view down to the street level? You know, these are all things we play with. You guys have done a great job in ACS uh, recently with your network visualization. That's also exploring like network traffic and how security flows are happening with firewalls. And you can think about global boundaries in that context. I mean, I love that. That really exposes teams to a view of the world that they probably hadn't considered before. Or if they did, they probably had to hammer out like, I don't know, hundreds of commands to figure it out. Uh, and, and just like one picture like that can really start to explain the story holistically. How is this application running? What are the routes that have been exposed? Where are my points of egress and ingress on this? Those network flows that you guys put together are exquisite. So well done. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Mina, so Kim couldn't make it because she had a lack of internet issues, but she did drop a question, I think, probably directed at you. How can ACM <laughs> help with governance and compliance? Thanks, Kim. Um, honestly, what I kind of wanted to talk about when it like relates to security is definitely our governance and compliance pillar is where we do most of that stuff because security teams are always thinking about how they can set those security policies across diverse environments and ensure the enforcement. Um, and again, ACM allows customers, uh, you know, Scott talked about this earlier, but ACM allows customers to control the full application lifecycle and the desired state security um, and compliance across multiple data centers. Um, and then these controls are linked to industry compliance standards and convey audit posture to the security operations teams. Earlier, you talked about um, consumability, Foster. And, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to SecOps teams, you know, consumability comes down to creating policies and assigning them dynamically, essentially. Um, so I think like kind of the biggest value prop of our governance and um, governance and compliance pillar is that you're able to, again, comes down to scale always, take thousands of 
thousands of clusters, see them in a single panel, and then push out your policies throughout. Um, and this, again, comes down to cost, uh, reduces operational cost because it just reduces the amount of labor and manual processes that go into that. Um, but I think like when you think of ACM, you don't, you don't necessarily think about security. And I think we have a lot of really great security tools within ACM, but when it comes together with ACS is when it makes, when it makes sense. And that's kind of what, you know, gave OpenShift Platform Plus uh, life is how do you bring these products together and how do you, you know, make sure that you're using all of their strengths together? Um, and this is something that we're uh, discussing with the ACS team right now is how can we moving forward kind of um, convey the strengths that ACS and ACM pull together and how the security features that come from uh, ACM work work well with ACS and obviously ACS is um, you know, the security expert when it comes to Platform Plus. But um, I think that's kind of what it comes down to is when they work together, they're even yep. better. But with ACM, mm -hmm. you do have some security um, and governance and compliance uh, features packed into that pillar. I think keeping the auditors off your back is also pretty uh, important, yes. right? Everything is code. You can say, hey, no, look, we're doing the right thing. We have our policy here. This is the cluster status. And I'm assuming, too, you know, if you set a policy and the cluster drifts, you're getting notifications of that as well. Right? Oh, yeah. So, Yes, uh, we can I mean, fire alerts off of that. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a huge uh, benefit. We did have another question from Duane. Uh, what are the challenges for RAN, ORAN, edge issues, uh, assuming with an ACM bent, uh, mm -hmm. Duane? So any thoughts? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll try that one. I mean, uh, great question. And the challenges really come down to network. They come down to latency. They come down to the size of the device. You know, edge, especially in the telecommunications space, is really focused on the 5G rollout. Sorry, that seems like a silly plug here, but uh, you know a lot of the partners we've been playing with, uh, uh, partnering with, um, are in that that crunch right now. They're like, we can't wait to get this rolled out in the next metro, right? Is that going to be Minneapolis? Is that going to be Chicago? Is it going to be wherever else? Uh, so we're, the challenges really come down to: Do we have the right technology stack to support those applications? Is it small enough? Is it lightweight enough? And then you have to talk about the life cycle of that stack. How do you upgrade it and make sure that the application doesn't just fall over and you lose, you know, network with you know, millions of people subscribed to your towers? Yeah. So yeah, all the like rolling upgrades out to the fleet. How do you start it small, measure the success rate of those upgrades, and then fan that out, you know, onto the eastern seaboard? So a lot of those questions that really plague the central IT and the platform admins, it also plagues uh, it, those, those same questions chase you and the, the same ghosts are haunting you as you approach the management and life cycle of your application out on the edge, it just so happens that it's often more critical. Well, I shouldn't say it's more critical, it's as critical, but that edge device is literally providing a safety and security feature perhaps to a, a car or a house or something that mm -hmm. really relies on its edge capability and the edge network to be alive. If that thing goes down, then perhaps it's not keeping an eye on, on the streets or on the airport or on the runway or whatever. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, the criticality of the business is moving to the edge. You're, you're seeing that more and more. Uh, the constrained size of those devices, the sheer number of those devices, those add to the challenges of how you manage out, out at the edge. Yeah, just, uh, I kind of want to see this in action, but as a small cultural comment, I mean, every single store I go to now has some sort of electronic shopping device, some sort of inventory management system. When you walk up, like everything is going super smart. I mean, hell, some of the fridges are are uh, smart devices that need to be updated, right? So I think this is going to be a consistent challenge and I don't really see it shrinking at all. I mean, even cars, right? I mean, we partnered with Ford during KubeCon. Um, there's a lot of different technologies moving into this space. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's going to be not necessarily what you think of as tech companies that are going to have this problem that they're going to have to solve for. Companies like, I don't know, any sort of inventory management system, Home Depot, you name it. I mean, this is not a Home Depot plug either. But... <laughs> Uh, I could see the just you see it in in the industry growing. So I think this is awesome. Um, now we did somewhat promise a demo. I see Dwayne actually comments. Is it possible I was federated? Or do do do? Well, let's see this. Zero trust for open science. Might have to clarify that one, Dwayne. So I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. But well, uh, you, maybe if we take a stab at that, you know, one of the sure. things that we were talking about, uh, Mina was highlighting ACMs, governance, risk, and compliance. Uh, and really, I want people to think about configuration management, config drift. And then if they, if we talk about ACS and your, your kind of security posture, you really are focused on the build and the shift left and secure supply chain and things that 
you know, maybe that's what the zero trust that Duane is talking about is ensuring that that part of the build and that part of the CI and, and the whole world where the developer lives is secure. So from left to right, we really are bookending the, the security definition here as part of OpenShift Platform Plus and ACM, mm -hmm. ACS working together. Uh, I, I don't know if that's where Duane was going, but that's what what I was thinking is, you know, maybe it's it's a way that we use both products together in the, 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 the the arena that they're designed in. Yeah, I, from my brief stint in research, I think a lot of it has to do with how data is shared and a lot of mm. the way the jobs are run. So it's, you know, there's some hacks that happen with uh, Jupyter Hub and mm -hmm. different applications that allow some uh, access to database that shouldn't be there. And I, I think that as we get more AI and more health data, you know, HIPAA and things like that, we don't exactly want to be sharing these databases. Um, 100%. That, that, that's my guess. Dwayne, correct me gotcha. if I'm wrong, but uh, no, I think that's awesome. Now, we did somewhat, I, I heard a promise of a demo, a <laughs> slight whisper, rumor. Yeah. Did you have something prepared for us? I don't want to put you on the spot. Let's do it. Yeah, let's flip it over. I'll spend a few minutes and just sure. to kind of to bring to, to, the, to the mind and focus in on what, is, what does it all look like. This is an environment running ACM. Um, you can see I've got uh, clusters that are spread across, across a bunch of different clouds, even my my vSphere like on-premise estate there. And really just in terms of like the overview, like you said, what do you do? So we can launch to Grafana and we can have like a board in-depth view of all this, but this is just kind of an overview and you start to see where I've got clusters with violation. Um, this really speaks to the language of policy and, and helping me dial into this is perfect environment. I have nothing <laughs> that has a, a, a perfectly you know, green uh, mark against it so this demo is is broken from the start everything needs work which is mm -hmm. great but you can see we're scanning across nine clusters something like 2000 pods uh 41 nodes and then you know down here i'm also bringing in some insights uh, directly from red hat so red hat insights takes the view of the entire fleet of openshift clusters and they boil that down into known issues and and, and issues that you can remediate so I'm, I'm also identifying that I've got a cluster with some known issues on it. And again, that's taking something like 20,000 plus OpenShift clusters, mining that data for, for interesting uh, symptoms and then providing uh, remediations out there. But this, you know, like pre can dashboard, like I said before, it doesn't speak everybody's language, but just kind of gives you a glimpse of where we are in this environment. Uh, from there, you know, if I just want to talk governance and specifically this is where we start to really cater in towards the security ops, towards the, the audit, you know, the controls team. We're speaking their language with standards and categories and controls. You know, I, I can start to look at my NIST standards here and I can really dial in and start to, to, to really go into that language and the jargon of baseline controls and security assessments. So as I have to like pivot the work I've been doing today and like in one minute, I'm a platform engineer and I'm configuring clusters in the next minute, someone taps on my shoulder and says, bro, like, do you have it all configured for this or that? Like, mm -hmm. you know, I can I can turn like, so yeah, look, here's how I'm doing that. And this is how I'm uh, addressing the concerns of security in a day-to-day -day basis. So violations are being reported, I have policy sets that help me group together policies. But oh, yeah. like, let's just take a look at a policy and, and feel free to interrupt if there's something that doesn't make sense or if it's not showing well on your screen. Um, I'm, I'm just going to quickly grab one that I know is in here. This is my Etsy D encryption policy. You can see it's 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 adhering to the NIST 853 mm -hmm. for protection of security at rest on um, the communications protection there. It's been enabled. Right now, it's just informing, so it's just telling me what's up. And I can tell that there's two clusters that are in good shape. So if I click in here and just want to get some more details, I can see it's it's two clusters, local cluster in Carolina. Um, and again, it's just informing. So just give me like an audit picture and let's see what that looks like. You know, I was, I was telling you before, Michael, like what's, what's cool for me is when I can see the code, like how this has been defined mm -hmm. and what we really want people to start to understand is this etcd encryption, it, it really kind of boils down to one simple section that you've probably seen before as you've defined, uh, you know, encryption on your cluster, which is tell the API server to go encrypt itself. Mm -hmm. and, and basically that's how you would do like an OC apply if you were going to, or OC ADM, like if you're going to run some commands to go do that manually, 
by wrapping that in a policy as code, I can now repeat this across a bunch of clusters by, by using placement. And in this case, I'm just saying any environment with a label of production, I want to I want to you know in, encrypt that CD. So go do it. Mm -hmm. um, another part of this is this YAML code. Like I wouldn't even be able to make changes in here because this is all stored in Git. So mm -hmm. I have the ability to just uh, point to that repository, and I can say, and I don't know if this is going to open or not. Maybe it's a new tab. But these are the these are actually the the source uh, uh, Git definitions. These are actually the source YAMLs mm -hmm. of that policy that was just on the screen. And you can see it's the exact same stuff here that I was telling my policy to do. So we have kind of training wheels like, hey, I just want to go in and, and start creating this policy. I'll do it directly locally uh, on that UI. And then over time, I build up my capability. I build up my repertoire. I can generate those policies directly from the source manifest that you might already have. You might already have uh, some YAMLs sitting around that you use for like day two configuration. Mm -hmm. Think about creating limits, creating roles, role bindings, users, uh, HT password account, all the kind of stuff you do on day two to configure a cluster. I can take those directly as they are, drop those YAMLs in the policy generator and create these policies, which I can now enforce out to the fleet. Yeah. So let me go switch back here. And I think there's a huge strength here, which is you can sort of set a, let's say gold golden cluster because the data science team might need something different from you know, the database team, right? But being able to go and say, okay, etcd encryption is a must at the start. And then, you know, maybe for some weird reason you don't need it. Well, then you can make that change later and sort of section that group off, right? And say, okay, this is the data sciences team's YAML configuration for their OpenShift clusters, correct? Yeah, that's right. So using the placement, I could come through here and start to set that remediation to different sets of clusters. Um, I just created this one for East and I'm going to enforce it. And I actually want to place this out to any of my environments in the, you know, I don't even think I have a region yet, but let's do this. Let's just say region equals, uh, I'm adding one on the, on the fly here create region and the value is going to be east. Okay. So just for giggles, I'm like creating a new policy. Um, I'm not going to sit around here with the annotations for the second, but I want to enforce this. What's this going to do? Well, nothing because I didn't do something right in here in my, <laughs> in my place at template. I went too fast. I forgot to add in here my enable etcd encryption. All right. And so now it's going to say, this is where it's going to do the enforcement there. It's going to actually check and verify. Good deal. And this time it's going to go through. All right. So it's going to quickly just scan out there. Does anything match region east? Mm -hmm. And the answer should be no, because I, I know for sure I don't I don't have that label. But what I can do is I can I can start to go into my clusters. And this is where you understand like once you create a policy, but once you have that relationship defined, any new cluster that you create, cool any yeah, any cluster that you import, let's say from a, a different user group, like all of a sudden you're onboarding 100 clusters. All I have to do is have that label. So let's go pick, um, I'm going to pick this ARO cluster here. This is Azure Red Hat. And I'm just going to add a region equals east. And you can see it has a Pac Man game deployed. <laughs> I know it's in Cloud Azure. Like it's got some other labels that are doing things there. But, um, let me go back real quick and find that policy and show you what's going on. I think it was called East something. Yeah, so now all of a sudden it has one cluster that has a violation. Um, it doesn't have the full status yet, but we went from zero to one and it's matched it on the arrow. That's where my label was. Mm -hmm. And I can start to drill in and I can see exactly what it's doing. So it's getting more results as it's scanning that API server and figuring out what's going on. Um, is it actually encrypted yet? Hasn't found it, it's still doing the work. It takes probably 30 seconds to a minute to come back on that cycle. But the point is now I've defined this policy for, for the group, like you were saying, Mike, like, well, I just want to define it on this group. And now it's found it's violated. So that's just updated. Since it's got enforce here, it's actually going to go do that work. So it's in the process of enforcing wow. that, which means it's going to go enforce etcd encryption on this ARO server. This is an Azure cloud. Um, and you'll see this come back. And that, yeah, it looks like a few seconds ago, 
it, it's just come back with the details that it, it has finished its work. And that was the policy. Uh, again, it's a basic example of etcd encryption, but I created that one locally here in the UI just to kind of mm -hmm. give you the view of the training wheels on. Now you have this block of code, like this is repeatable. I can go take this and version that within my Bitbucket or you know my Git repo. I can make sure I have PRs and like four eyes of review as I go through this, if I want to iterate this code or make some changes to it. But yeah, I'm giving you all the keys to the kingdom really like in your hands mm -hmm. uh, and, and allowing you to, to move forward with that, uh, with repeatability across your fleet. Any other cluster now where I start to give it that label, it's going to adhere to that same policy. Let's just take another one for the sake of hitting you on the head with this <laughs> example. Uh, I'm going to add a Rosa cluster here, and then I'll go back into that policy and we'll see it react. Uh, I hope that looked easy. I hope that was informative. But I mean, the idea here is, is we're really bringing the keys to the kingdom and allowing you to configure it um, one time, and then you have the repeatability, repeatability to go from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it definitely keeps the boss off your back. Sorry, Mina, because the boss says, hey, say, you know, you know, is this, encrypted? <laughs> this comes down to when we talked about how, you know, when you adopt this earlier on in your, in your, in your journey, the more you can get out of it as you, as you scale. So yep. thank you for showing that. This was helpful for me too, honestly. Awesome. There's an automation section here. I didn't even get into this, but we, we hook into Ansible. So from here, like if I had an Ansible a tower that was running, I would be able to start scheduling Ansible jobs that would take place in result of something being non-compliant, for example. Mm -hmm. If I need to go renew some certificates or something that's more like, let's call it off cluster, maybe update a ServiceNow ticket, maybe inform a team in Slack that something's just taking place. Really Ansible, the sky's the limit with what you want to do there. But that integration through all of our lifecycle areas gives me the capability to in interact with different parts of your infrastructure and a whole new realm of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Do you find that the inform feature is used uh, most often early on as people learn and grow with Kubernetes? Absolutely. And, and also as they grow with ACM, I mean, it's kind of like training wheels. It's also like just great from an audit perspective. You know, do I have Argo CD? Uh, like, do I have OpenShift GitOps operator deployed? Here's one that's the compliance operator. And, and so I'm just using this as an inform way to show me I have the, uh, the operator that I want deployed. Do I have it deployed at the right version? Yes. Okay. These three, these two clusters, it is. These ones have violations. They're, they're, it's not deploying the compliance operator in the way that I expect it to be. And then I'd have a chance to go fix that. I have a chance to go remediate and, and, and adjust that. Um, other examples would be like performing upgrades. That's one I like to see where, you know, I've got all the operators out there. I've got the environment running well. And then I want to use a, a policy that says, go bring this environment up to a new version. So go on the stable 4.11 channel, move me up to 4.11.9. Or, you know, maybe now you it's want to go to, go to 4.12? Yeah, just released. Come on. Yeah, let's do it. Let's go to 4.12. Um, I'm going to say it's 4.12.0. So now I have this. Let's see where I'm. Oh, I don't want to do this on my local cluster. Let's try a different <laughs> one. Uh, let me pick my, uh, this is getting a little squished up on my screen. I don't know about you. Uh, let me just pick the cluster by name. Okay. And, and this one I'm going to do is, um, uh, I don't want that. I want, um, I'm just going to do it like upgrade. I'm going to make a new label. How about that? Upgrade now. <laughs> And I'm going to go put this on a cluster that I know should be able to handle it. And then we'll see what happens. Oh, it's going to be an inform anyway. This is good. Mm -hmm. So we're doing the training wheels example. And I'm going to take Carolina. You can see it's currently at 4.11.9. And I'm going to add that label for upgrade now. And the label is how we reconcile the work. It says, hey, do I have work to do? Mm -hmm. OK, yeah, I've got a new label. Um, and I can click on Carolina. And I can see you know, it's setting the distribution of uh, 4.11. It's actually, I guess maybe at some point we had set it to fast 412. I'm not sure. Uh, this, so this could be interesting. But what it's going to effectively do is it's going to start applying that policy against that cluster. And in theory, if this, if this does what I think it should, it should update that ver version distribution to kick off the upgrade. 
Now I could manually do that. I can click mm -hmm. here and I can go to the latest, you know, version in my stream. I probably should have done some better homework on this demo. And, and I don't know <laughs> if like a 4.11.9 can actually go to 4.12. Mm -hmm. It may not be in the upgrade graph. That's something that, that gets me. But let's, you know, for giggles, let's just go back and look at that upgrade uh, policy and let's just see how it's reporting. And That's yeah, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. it's got a violation. It's definitely not at the version that I want it to be. And that's true. So I only put it in form. I forgot. I didn't tell it to enforce. Um, out of curiosity, though, let's go back to it and let's tell it to enforce. Sorry, I'm having too much fun, Mike. I, I was going to say, this is, yeah, this I is awesome. Say, Dad, you're like a kid in a playground. <laughs> yeah. Let's break it off. This is what I do on my Friday nights, I promise. <laughs> um, so I actually just told it to enforce, and um, we should see like something actually try to happen now yeah. um, before it was just informing me. Now, somebody um, tries to do an upgrade that you shouldn't be doing. I'm assuming there's going to be a notification. Something should pop through. So for that, what I would use, Mike, I would use an admission control that mm -hmm. would block somebody from even trying to do that, right? Okay. So uh, if, if they even try to admit something to the cluster version control, it would just block it immediately at the admission and say, no, we, we're not going to let you do that. And then that would give full control basically to the platform engineers that says, I control this cluster and I can I can control it with policy uh, to initiate it when I want it to happen, things like that. Very cool. Yeah. Oh, there, it just flipped to stable 4.12. Uh, it hasn't quite, so out there on the cluster, mm -hmm. on that managed cluster, it's actually figuring out the upgrade graph, you know, as it's doing its thing. And then it's going to tell me either it's begun the upgrade or maybe something failed, like something mm -hmm. just didn't go well. I'm not logged in on that cluster right now, but it, it, it's feeding that information back to me. But for sure, I can see the sign that my enforcement worked because I went to stable 412 right here. There you go. Dwayne says he wants a playground like that. Yeah, with uh, how many clusters do you have? Like eight clusters and... Uh, these are real yeah. clusters. I mean, yeah. we could be putting kind clusters or some other garbage in here, but um, <laughs> we try to we try to live with reality as much as we can. And then from a, yeah, so from a, uh, the policy perspective, it now is reporting that it has updated the cluster version to the to the version I've told it to, mm -hmm. and now that upgrade is you know basically taping, taking taking shape out there. If anybody's ever gone through an upgrade before, you know it, it could take some time. But that's the wheels are in motion. Let's put it that way. Very very cool. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, anybody who's watching, any last questions for the ACM team? Put them in the chat. Otherwise, we're probably going to wrap things up soon. We're going. I give you guys some of your afternoon back, but uh, I definitely no, chewed you. up. I chewed up way more than the five minutes I told you I'd take. Oh no, that was awesome though. I uh, yeah. I love seeing ACM in action, and every time I learn something new, whether it's you guys are updating things, there's always a, another little feature that I, that I see. So I think it's it was awesome. Well, there's like the fun part of this, Mike, is there's the policy collection. You know, if if Dwayne wants a playground, go look in the policy collection. There's like 300 plus policies out there doing all kinds of stuff. Our back. Mm. OAuth, um, IDP configs, um, defining operators, even third-party contributions from, like, I think Trilio Vault just put something up there, and uh, you know, shout out to them on a great blog that they put together. But honestly, like, it, it's it's a rich opportunity for people to come together from the consulting practices, uh, developers, and, and gurus out there that just have a, a lot of time on their hands on Friday nights to go play. But yeah, a lot of great uh, content out there in the policy collection repo. Yeah, that reminds me. I know at Red Hat we want to uh, use uh, OpenShift Commons as a space for you know customers and users to share that information. So I think we want to create a security channel coming up. Kim and I will definitely be a part of that, where you know policy collections or you know our back controls with ACS or policies with ACS as well. Everything can be shared, um, just to allow new users to onboard quicker too. Right? I think that's the goal is to see uh, leverage you know bigger customers. Let's say if you're a smaller ACM user. Uh, and then you you can become a power user over time. Yeah. Have one, we, sorry, okay. go ahead. Oh, right, there's one ACS question. Uh, always nice to hear the scanner working so fast. So how does image scanning work? First time you install ACS into your cluster, uh, it takes it goes through and takes an inventory of all of your images that are there. Which means that all we have to do whenever anything is updated is just take that next little image layer and scan it. Now, if you go and have a complete new container, it'll be you know a little bit slower but in general it's the caching that makes it super fast and i think that with the cloud service it's going to be 
uh, there's be more some more functionality coming out soon. But uh, any other ACM questions? Throw them in the chat. Uh, Scott, what were you going to say before I rudely cut you off? No, I was just totally agreeing with you. Um, part of the the next steps, let's say, like as we look to the future, it's the kind of feedback that you're describing, Michael, which is how do you smooth out the on ramp? How do you make it easier for me to get started with policy so that I don't even have to like cobble together some repo? And so making it easier, like just making baby steps everywhere so that someone who's really focused on security probably doesn't want to spend a lot of time with writing code and like dropping a new repo. Mm -hmm. Maybe in my vision, my dream of the world that that person could, could take it on, but just make a quick, easy button where they could start to onboard policies directly out of the, the policy collection or even the stable ones that I already have on the box. Give, give me some fine tuned examples that work perfectly every time. Um, those kind of experiences and like you talked about with ACS and ACM working together, better sharing of in, information. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you find those uh, build in, uh, scan uh, problems, when, you, when your network uh, tooling surfaces some issues, let's inform each other, right? Like mm -hmm. these are some areas we can, we can continue to collaborate as we go forward to enrich it and make it, you know, one plus one should equal 10, uh, right? Like let's yep. make the, the information across security like end to end just, just become more powerful within all of our tools. Yeah, and especially because, you know, we have enforcement mechanisms in ACS uh, for cluster, um, even host scanning coming in a, a few of the new releases. If we can push that to ACM where we can have the policy that's created and then all we need to do is just kind of watch to make sure nothing gets out of whack, you know, then we're both better off for it. We send less Slack messages to each other. We like each other more between the different organizations. So, yeah, um, yeah I think that asynchronous communication is always, I mean, that's the strength, right? Keeping uh, dev and ops. DevSecOps, keeping them loving each other. Although, uh, what is it, platform engineering now? The whole thing just has to, <laughs> has to work, but. Yeah, uh, platform engineering seems to be the big catch-all for all, all the problems. But, you know, I think what you're really driving at, Mike, is making sure that the dev experience is still promoted with you know, like the spotlight. Like, let's make it easy for humans to get access to what they need. Mm -hmm. And you said something early on in the cast today. It was like, we're, we're kind of focusing a lot on clusters and life cycling them and, you know, building up a, a, an army of capabilities and, and, and features around that. I also look forward to the day that I don't have to care about that cluster anymore, <laughs> yeah. that it's just like an artifact collecting dust on the shelf. And then I can just immediately start to do what I wanted to do and go innovate in this world and create something new. Mm -hmm. And so part of what we're trying to do again, like just going back to square one is smooth out that friction and, headache and toil so that those environments are ready for users to go take them on. Things like HyperShift is making it faster to get clusters, uh, more ephemeral clusters like playground environments, mm -hmm. things like templates that can make it very easy to stamp them out. So those are areas that we're working on and, and moving towards to make it just friction free to get the environment and start getting to work. Sure. I, I posted a bunch of links in there. What's next roadmap, upstream policy collection that you mentioned and a policy generator as well. Sweet. Uh, yeah. yeah. Do you think we're going to have like, hey, uh, chat GBT, create me some ACM policies <laughs> soon? What's, uh... I love it. I love it. Mina, let's get cracking on it. That sounds like a good weekend project. Sure. Yeah. We got to teach uh, chat GPT. Okay. What's the difference between ACM and ACS? Uh, let's see if, <laughs> it, let's see if our that. jobs are going away. <laughs> Maybe it's out ahead on this one. It's like, no, y'all are doing the same thing you're solving security <laughs> from different different angles and mm -hmm. it probably has a real good spin on that but can it say it in like a drunken pirate voice for me that would be the best <laughs> yeah sure <laughs> take on the persona of a shakespearean poet as you describe security across opp i'm not even gonna attempt that my uh just i'm horrible at impressions but <laughs> chat gpt awesome. can do it for us yeah there you go uh mina scott any last words before we head out uh, just getting to the top of the hour now. Any last call outs? Nope. No? That's all uh, right. Yeah. Cool. Had a great time on your show, Mike. Thanks yeah. for inviting us. Pleasure being here. And it is. And uh, I think you obviously have a bunch of things coming up at Summit as well, right? Um, and KubeCon EU it will always be big. So I'm sure you'll see some more. You'll see us there. Until next time, uh, next month, third Tuesday of the month, Kim and I will be back. Hopefully Kim's internet service will be working. Speaking of 5G rollouts going poorly. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, thank you again so much for coming on the stream. And we hope to see you next month. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.